Hello, and welcome to Examine Earth. Today, we're going to answer the question, could Quetzalcoatlus take down an airplane? This question is inspired by the recent Jurassic World Dominion trailer. If you haven't seen it yet, go check it out. At the 208 minute mark, we see our heroes in the cockpit of a plane, and then something's not quite right. That's another plane, right? Not exactly. And then the pterosaur, not a dinosaur, by the way, lands with a thud. It punches out both engines. And well, uh, I guess we'll have to wait until June to find out. So the Jurassic Park franchise is a good time. It gets a lot of things right and it makes dinosaurs cool again, but sometimes they take some liberties. For a movie, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's important to be able to recognize the difference. Is this one of those times or could this actually happen? Assuming that Quetzalcoatlus was here. <laughs> uh, well, let's get ready to rumble. In this corner, the C-119 flying boxcar, and you can see why it's called that. It literally looks like a train car with wings. And you can see the pretty odd twin boom tail that helps it with airdrops. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the sea duck from Tailspin, <laughs> but uh, I digress. This plane mostly saw action in the Korean War, carrying troops and cargo, so it was built for war. So our pterosaur might have its hands or uh, wings uh, full on this one, but let's check out the stats. Uh, first built by Fairchild after the Second World War, has a length of 87-ish feet and a wingspan of 109 feet. So this is a pretty large plane. It weighs 20 tons empty and can carry another 10 tons of cargo. Quite formidable indeed. But what does our pterosaur bring to the ring? In this corner, Quetzalcoatlus. Probably Northrop I because of its incredible size. This or another similar pterosaur is very likely the largest animal that's ever flown. But how large? If you're gonna take down a plane, size matters. So let's check the stats. The product of millions of years of genetics, natural selection and evolution it first appeared near the end of the Cretaceous. Pterosaurs were trending towards larger body sizes, and this is a big one. There are a few other pterosaurs that get near this size, maybe a little bit bigger. So is this at or near the physical limits of flight for flesh, bone, and sinew? This thing was so tall, it could look a giraffe in the eye, if giraffes were a thing. A wingspan comparable to a small private jet, capable of flying at speeds, uh, like modern eagles and albatrosses. This thing was big, it was fast. Uh, here it is compared to the largest living bird and largest living insect of all time. And it weighs in at a colossal, wait, what? Uh, similar to an adult human or two, interesting. Uh, let's take a closer look at Quetzi's size and some pterosaur anatomy. But before we do, uh, why such large ranges? So the Quetzalcoatlus genre is known from scant remains Pterosaur bones are relatively airy to stay light, and so they're difficult to preserve. Uh, Northrop I, the largest, is known from only a partial wing. Uh, museum skeletal mounts are heavily leveraged on more complete specimens from similar animals to fill in the gaps, so there's some uncertainty. But could the scene in the trailer actually happen? Well, first off, accidental bird strike, or pterosaur strike in this case, doesn't count. That's not what happens in the film. This is a deliberate attack. Why is it attacking again? Eh, I guess we should ask this guy, a French pilot who allegedly encountered an angry mother eagle during an air race, but he warded it off with his pistol. Uh, pretty sweet story. Flocks of even small birds and insects even can severely impact modern aircraft. Uh, most large strikes involve vultures or Canada geese, and the strikes are most dangerous when striking the windshield or the engines. Uh, probably most famously, Sully Solenberger's plane hit a flock of Canada geese, but then he managed to safely land it in the Hudson River. So bird strike can be very dangerous. Airports employ radar and other deterrents to keep flocks away from runways. And sometimes they even use bird on bird violence to keep the runways clear. But again, that's not what we're dealing with here. This was no accident. Uh, so if our pterosaur is gonna take down a plane, first it needs to take flight. The debate over large pterosaur flight seems pretty settled now, but there was some back and forth in the literature. Uh, one main misconception that fueled a lot of the debates is that the flight models, some of them, were using body densities and mass distributions of modern birds. 
But pterosaurs are not birds. They work very differently. Uh, let's start with the structure of the wing. Uh, so pterosaurs were the first vertebrates to fly, and they support their wing membranes with a single finger and probably some fibrous filaments. Uh, the ring finger is the wing finger. Birds have fused their fingers together, and they use feathers instead of a membrane. And bats use all five fingers to support their wing membrane. And so this is a great example of convergent evolution. Nature solved the problem of flight in three similar ways, but at three different times in three very different animals, four if you count insects. Uh, if we want to know if pterosaurs could fly, though, we need to know their body mass, and we also need to know the distribution of that mass, and we need to know if the wings could support that load to keep them aloft. Notice that the wingspan estimates here are pretty consistent, but the mass estimates vary pretty widely, and even the very low end estimates, probably too low, are over twice as heavy as the heaviest flying birds today, uh, things like bustards and turkeys. Uh, there's little argument about whether smaller pterosaurs could fly, and the body morphology, limb ratios, and bone structure scales up pretty linearly, uh, as expected for the increased load of the larger Quetzalcoatlus. There's nothing fundamentally different about Quetzi aside from that larger size. Uh, it seems pretty unlikely that large pterosaurs were grounded, so the answer here is almost certainly yes, they could fly. But flying and gliding is very different from launching, uh, some models, again, primarily based on birds, suggested that they would need to cliff jump or behave like a hang glider or a kite in a stiff breeze. This doesn't seem like a reasonable thing for an animal to rely on, so how did they take off? There's quadrupedal trackways that indicate that pterosaurs probably walked on all fours, similar to bats. They probably also launched from all fours, like bats as well. Uh, in birds, a takeoff starts with a powerful leap. So birds have well-muscled legs. Think about like a turkey drumstick versus the smaller wings. And all that leg mass is used only for launch. Once it's airborne, it's dead weight. And so it limits their overall body size. So in birds, the muscles for launching and the muscles for flight are competing against each other. In quad launch from all fours, the same muscle groups that launch are also used in flight. As takeoff muscles get larger for larger body size, they're also more useful in flight. This give and take of birds is absent in pterosaurs thanks to quad launch. So birds and pterosaurs can skip leg day and focus on their wings. Dr. Mark Witten has an excellent blog post on a topic. I'll put a link in the description below. Uh, so that was some info on pterosaurs, but let's get back on topic. Uh, what we're talking about again? Uh, oh yeah. So could Quetzalcoatlus take down a plane, this particular plane, I don't wanna yuck anyone's yum here, and the scene is still really cool, but the answer is a strong no. Uh, the first issue is that the size is wrong. Uh, the Dominion pterosaur is simply too big, like way too big. Here's a comparison here in this chart. Uh, just like with the Mosasaurs, Velociraptors, and others, they scaled them up for dramatic effect. But even if it were this large, uh, it would still weigh a small fraction of the plane. Uh, previous movies show pterosaurs kind of crashing through things, but they just weren't that heavy, uh, and so carrying people away is right out, too. Uh, as for punching out the engines, the bones of the wings were tough, but uh, they were about the same diameter as legs of a modern hippo, even though say, they supported much less weight, but they were built for the stresses of flight, not for punching planes. So I think we have to chalk this one up for the C-119. Congratulations. Uh, the scene is still super cool and I can't wait to see it, but it's important to know when Jurassic Park is sticking close to the science and uh, when it's taking some artistic liberties. Uh, if you want to know more about pterosaurs, uh, please check out my free dinosaur video course. Uh, up here somewhere is a link to this not dinosaurs video. Uh, I'll also put a link in the description below. This particular video discusses a lot of the other things that were around during the age of the dinosaurs and explains why pterosaurs aren't dinosaurs. Uh, if you enjoyed this video and like to see others like it, please click the like button and subscribe to the channel. You can also let me know in the comments, comments below uh, other topics that you would like to see. That's all for today. Thanks for stopping in to examine Earth. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>